Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont show. I'm Bruce Wilson, Executive Director. And I have an incredible guest today, and we'll talk to um, to today um, in a few minutes. But right now, uh, I want to up update you on some of the things that we're doing through our programs. Uh, most of you know that we have a um, gallery in the University of Morocco, Art So Wonderful. It's a Art So Wonderful Gallery and Performing Center. And uh, we we um, we changed places in, in um, I think it was May May 22nd. And uh, so we've been doing some incredible things in there. So it's 8,000 square feet. We had um, Vermont Youth Symphony Orchestra perform there. Um, we have um, uh, black artists uh, performing there coming up three times. And, and we have um, like over 400 pieces of art in there. A lot of the artists, most, all of the artists are from around, artists from around Vermont. Some of the artists have art in galleries around the country. Very famous artists. If nothing else, you can come in there. You should bring your kids or your partner or whoever just to check it out. Just walk around and see the art that um, Vermont have to offer. It's incredible. You know, I, I sit there and just watch, uh, look at the art. And, like, I'm so always amazed. And so many people want to put our art in our gallery. And, um, and I'm, I'm willing to let that happen. Um, we also have 60% of the murals in Burlington are ours. Art So Wonderful uh, murals. We created that in 2003. In 2010, we created Art So Wonderful Electric Boxes. All those cool electric boxes you see around is through Art So Wonderful Electric Boxes, as well as um, our partners around, um, primarily around Chinook County. We do have them in Rutland and, and St. Albans, and we'll put one in your neighborhood too. Um, we have over 50 awards, and we have done over 700 events. And so I'm very excited to, to right now, and <laughs> I am excited to talk to Big Hartman, who is the executive director and the legal counsel for uh, Human Rights Commission, and that's in um, Vermont. And uh, um, Big has is, got an uh, incredible staff and, and represent a lot for people who looks like everybody in the state. Mm -hmm. So Big, tell us about, um, first of all, how did you get involved in, um, in human rights? Well, thanks so much for having me, Bruce. I'm really happy to be here and be talking with you. Anytime I get to talk with you, I'm happy. Um, uh, Bruce you. is one of our commissioners at the Human Rights Commission, and I really thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Um, but uh, I got involved in doing human rights work mostly because I was an attorney. I went to law school because I wanted to see change in the world. I wanted to see a more just America. And um, I feel very blessed and fortunate that I've been able to continue to work in Vermont since going to Vermont Law School. Um, and I've been with the Human Rights Commission um, for just about two and a half years now. I started as a staff attorney investigator, and I just recently became the executive director in July. Wow, man. And I know I was part of the hiring process of, among um, the four other commissioners. And um, wow, we are always so excited, you know, uh, big um, boy Yang was our ED before you, and she, oh boy, was so smart. I'm glad she, I'm glad you learned a lot under her tutelage. I'm telling you, boy, boy, boy comes with the answer, you know. And, and um, if boy don't have the answer, boy find the answer, <laughs> and that and that's a lot of, of like you, you know. If, if you don't have the, you always come with the angles. If you don't have, you always come with the answer, big, <laughs> big always come with the answer, and. And who to know if you never had the answer? Because you know you always come with the answer, and um, you're very like you know like you know boom. You know what I mean? Like you you, you know you, you, ain't, you ain't taking no you ain't taking nothing from nobody. It's all good. You know what I mean? You want to work? You want to do the? Um, um, you work for the people who you serve. I love that so much about a uh, big, um, big also a part of like the, our community. You know we do a lot of things in the community. Talk to people. Uh, um, be on like not just on the. Um, the Straight Talk for my show, but you all other shows, you do um, letters and you, you talk to people, you answer questions for individuals who are just very curious and interested about what is Human Rights Commission, which is HRC acronyms. And um, I'm happy and proud to be one of your uh, commissioners. And uh, I depend, <laughs> as you know, I depend on you. I'm like, uh, oh, big, well, where should we go? Can we go this way? Should we go? And then you always, you know, take me to the right place. So, so uh, thank you for for being an AD, and thank you for um, allowing me to be a commissioner. Also, too, I'm um, telling you, um, 
um, as as as, uh, as the R E D when I found out your name was a part of in the pool to be uh, one of the employees you know, who were applying for the E D position, man, <laughs> I was so happy. I was so I mean I said you know I, I, mean, I got you know uh, you know I just was happy that you you know want to do this work you know I mean to go uh, you know the not stay in your position just go higher than you know being in our legal counsel and being our you know, I was working with, um, what was your position? At? Yeah, I was uh, doing investigative work, um, investigating the discrimination complaints that come to the Human Rights Commission. I'm so glad you mentioned Bor Yang, uh, my predecessor. Yeah. Bor was really an inspiration to me and the reason that I wanted to come work at the HRC in the first place because she really, um, uh, you know, Push, it has been pushing the, the needle forward for all people who um, might be facing discrimination in Vermont. Um, I was obviously just as sad as you to hear that she was leaving, and it felt really important to me to be able to provide some continuity for our work um, rather than have someone come in, you know, needing to learn kind of everything about our process. It felt really important mm -hmm. that we um, be able to maintain our not have any gap in service, not have any gap in um, our casework and uh, all of the important policy work that we're doing across the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing, good thing too, is like um, when we did the, we were saying, it's a, I thought we did a good um, interview process. What do you think? You think our interview process was pretty decent with our staff and our um, commissioners and do um, you think we did? Yeah, I thought it was decent? very in depth. Uh, the the only thing I would have changed about it is that my first interview was the day of the flood, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was by phone, uh, oh, yeah. trapped at my house. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, right. I would have I would have preferred different timing on that. It was kind of a stressful <laughs> day. Oh, I bet it was. Uh, as a Montpelier resident, mm. uh, or you know, living outside of Montpelier area, it was there was just a lot a lot going on, but. Um, but I was I was very happy that once the decision was made, I was able to just hit the ground running um, and work to backfill my investigator position right away. Mm -hmm. Kind of feel like we should back up and let folks know about what we do at the Human Rights Go Commission. Right yep. um, so we are a state agency um, in the state of Vermont. We're based out of Montpelier, <laughs> and we receive um, complaints of discrimination. Um, in three main areas, housing, all housing co discrimination complaints can come to us. We also investigate complaints that are brought to HUD um, involving housing discrimination. Um, also, any discrimination in places of public accommodation, which is a really broad um, area of the law, basically any public place, any government service, it can be schools, it can be police stops, it can be any services from state government, as well as businesses, hotels, restaurants, like anything that serves the public is considered a place of public accommodation. So if folks feel they've been discriminated against in housing or places of public accommodation, we are the place to come to have that complaint heard and investigated. Um, also, we do investigations of employment discrimination for only for state employees. If you are a, a non-state employee and you think you've experienced employment discrimination, you can go to the Attorney General's office where they would do an investigation or the EEOC, which is uh, the federal agency, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Those cases, if they involve state employees, will get referred to our office and we generally will conduct those investigations ourselves. Um, and uh, once, uh, if we just, it, so people can contact us by phone, by email, through our website, we have a questionnaire, um, and uh, just calling our main line. Uh, we only have one staff person who receives all of the inquiries we receive every day, um, who can take those calls and respond to those emails. So it can be, um, you know, a little bit of a wait time. Sometimes people really are experiencing Mm -hmm. an urgent situation and we aren't always able to respond to those in you know the time that people need so we can often provide a referral for maybe another agency that might be able to support folks in the immediate needs once um, we if we receive enough information to believe that someone has stated a claim of discrimination under the law then we um, 
will help the individual with a drafting a complaint if they need that assistance. And then we would uh, initiate an investigation. We have three staff attorney investigators who are charged with uh, investigating complaints all over the state. Um, they are uh, disinterested individuals in that they do not represent either party. They are non-biased, non objective investigators looking at facts, conducting interviews, um, gathering documents, reviewing emails, whatever may be relevant to a particular case. And then they will issue um, an investigative report. If they're not able to assist the parties with some type of conciliation, some type of settlement or resolution, um, they'll write an investigative report. You're, you're very familiar, Bruce, with those. Um, they're yeah. very detailed, very comprehensive summary of the facts, the investigation that was conducted, and they also include a legal analysis. Um, those reports are reviewed by the commissioners at our uh, monthly meetings, and the commissioners are the ones who actually vote and make a determination as to whether or not discrimination has occurred. That is um, not the equivalent to like a judge ordering it or a jury trial. It's a determination under the law. It can be helpful to get the parties to find a resolution. And um, it opens up a six month time period where the HRC um, will help the parties with a, with a settlement if we can. Or, or we may decide to take the, the matter ourselves to court to enforce um, Vermont's anti-discrimination statutes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we, see, we do a lot, and you said we only have um, three attorneys, that, three staff attorneys that does the investigation. That's right. And um, is that's, that's um, through HRC, right? Yeah, through our three, our three attorneys. We have three attorneys on staff who are the investigators. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And one person who um, is our executive our staff assistant, yeah. Maya Henry. Your, your administration, administrator. Uh, administrator, assistant, yeah, who uh, receives all those initial inquiries yeah. mm -hmm. and questions. Um, so it's, it's, it's really tough. Uh, the investigators are handling a large caseload. Anytime there's staff turnover, uh, you know, cases ha slow down. Mm -hmm. And it, some cases uh, take you know, two or three years to come to com completion, which we know is not ideal. Um, in my dream, in my dream world, we would have double the staff. Oh, no doubt about it. That's my dream world for you, too. Know. You know that, and we're going to do it. Um, so let me ask you a question. Um, so when an individual call in or e email you or, or go to the website, whatever ways they contact you to say they, have a, they think they might have a, um, a case, a discrimination case based on being through um, housing or... Um, uh, through you know HUD, I guess, and, and um, em employees for the state. Mm -hmm. um, how long does it? T and, and you find, because you're you're the ultimate, you're the principal. You you find that okay, this is a good case. After uh, your team um, bring it to you, or Meyer probably bring, or administrator, your administrator bring it to you and say, this is. I don't know how that works. Does, does she say this is a? Uh, does Meyer? Does I, your your lead person or administrator say uh, this is, might be a good case or? And, should we all look at this? How that work? Then you do the case. Then you do a case. Uh, how does it work? Yeah. yeah. So our staff person who handles the intakes is not an attorney. Um, primarily, she's just gathering information and giving folks an opportunity to tell their story, um, to see, and then she brings that information to me. We decide whether I decide whether to. Um, uh, Proceed with yeah, the, make it a complaint. A complaint. Uh, okay. Once it's a complaint, then we assign an investigator to handle it. We send out a notice of the complaint mm -hmm. to the respondents, the people who are accused of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, we give them uh, a letter that says that they have to provide a response to that complaint, mm -hmm. to a point by point to each paragraph of the mm -hmm. complaint, to either um, admit or deny, provide additional information. There's always, you know, more to the story that we need to hear. So we ask them to also pro produce any documents that they may have that are relevant to the case. Mm -hmm. And then the investigator will proceed um, once they have that information. Sure. Um, so we take on the case, right? So how long does it usually take? I know you said it, but I, I just I didn't write it down. So. It really varies, um, but I would say it's 
it's a, a, a fast, yeah, our, our rules say that we shall make every reasonable effort to complete an investigation in six months. That is not, we're not able to do that right now. Based on the points that I've seen through the, um, some of the complaints that are reporting through our investigators, it's a lot of points. It's, they talk to a lot of people. It's, um, it's a big, big deal. It's, it's, just, it's just not a small thing. It's, the investigative uh, work is incredibly detailed. Right. You know, and, then, um, and, and so when I, what I'm saying is that, um, wow, they talk to everybody. You know, that's, that's concern, you know. We and, really oh. do. We try to talk to anyone who has relevant information, and sometimes that can take a few months to get someone in person. We try to meet with mm -hmm. them, um, you know, live. And um, then once the all of the interviews and documents have been com reviewed and completed, then there's an investigative report that's written that is very extensive. Mm. As you know, sometimes they're, they're 10 or 15 pages, but that's got to be like a really simple set of facts. More often we're looking at 20 or 30 page reports, especially wow. if it's a series of <clears throat> events. If someone's claiming harassment, for example, it's usually um, over time. It's something that ha there are multiple incidents that we have to investigate and then summarize and then analyze, including doing a lot of legal research. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the dream scenario, we would get cases done within six to 12 months. In reality, it's more like 12 to 24 months. I have, just when I came on as an investigator, there were a, a, there was a lot of older cases that had been waiting for a new investigator to get assigned to them. Some of those cases I completed as quickly as I could, and it was a total of maybe three, three or more years that those cases had been pending with wow. us. And sometimes that means it's another f year before that the actual events we were investigating occurred. Um, if someone does want to file a complaint with us, our rules require that they come, come to us and file a complaint within one year of the last incident of the event of the discriminatory act. So people don't want to wait too long to come to us. Mm -hmm. But also, if, if too much time has passed, it's very hard to get a oh, clear yeah. picture of what really happened. People may not be available, people may have moved, we've lost contact information, or people just don't remember things anymore, or even mm -hmm. people pass away. Um, so we can get the best investigation uh, in, the, in the most timely manner if we, if we hear about it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, just the initial intake process, getting from contacting our office to there being an actual complaint signed, that can take a few months yep. easily. Yeah. So, so let me share, ask you a question, Big. Uh, <clears throat> is, is there a timeline for like a, a complaint? Like, uh, like say, like through the state, let's say state, let's say through one of our state employees, you know, DOC or whatever, I'm just hypothetical, you know. Um, now, do they have a timeline that they can come and complain to you, complain, file a complaint with um, HRC about whatever, that, whatever happened? Is it a timeline that you say, oh, that's too long and we can't do it? It just has to be within one year. Oh, gotcha. And then, and then they're fine to come, come Is that to us. We have to get the complaint filed within one year of the date of the incident, or right. at least they need to have told us, you know, express their intention to file a complaint mm. with us. Awesome. Yeah, but um, but uh, there's no timeline for how long our cases okay. have mm -hmm. to take by our rules or statute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, so I know HRC offer trainings like human rights. Um, yeah. You know your rights and think, can you go explain some of those trainings that we 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 do or could do or can put together for maybe a organization or public for the public. Absolutely. Um, as you know, the trainings is a topic that you and I share a deep passion for, um, getting the word out to everyone what the, what the law says, what our process is, um, you know, what the expectations are for all people. So uh, we are revamping our training plan for this year, um, for the, you know, the 2024 calendar year. But right now, what we've historically offered and what we will continue to offer for sure is monthly fair housing trainings. Those since COVID times have been uh, offered virtually and we seem to be finding that platform works well. So those trainings are 
once a month, um, uh, one Monday morning a month that uh, folks can attend those virtually. And um, those are live in-person trainings taught by our staff attorney investigators who are really the experts in the state about fair housing. It's mainly, um, it's not exactly a know your rights um, training, it's more of like, what folk, what especially landlords and housing, housing providers should know um, so that they uh, comply with the law. Um, but we do from time to time offer Know Your Rights trainings. Last year we published a Know Your Rights booklet um, that's available in uh, the 14 languages that are most commonly spoken in Vermont. And uh, we also do trainings, historically we've done trainings kind of on request um, whenever anyone in the community is looking for a training on a certain topic, if we're able to provide it, we, we do do those and they're now, we now offer them free of charge. Um, but that has included topics like harassment and bullying in schools, it's included things like um, uh, workplace harassment prevention and we're going to be looking this year towards a real comprehensive discrimination prevention series um, so our wonderful director of policy education and, Out and outreach Amanda Gar says and I are developing a multi-course sort of uh, six month long uh, series that folks can attend um, some will be in person, some will be virtual. These are going to include general uh, uh, information about the Human Rights Commission and our anti-discrimination statutes, um, and then inclusive practices. Uh, uh, implicit bias is a really big topic that we've offered a lot of trainings on over the years. We consider that sort of foundational information for discrimination prevention is to become aware of what are our biases that we hold that are unconscious that might be um, uh, playing out in our interactions with others. And then uh, uh, we've recently, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, with a coalition of uh, amazing folks, have developed Let's Talk Race Cards, which are a, uh, a training and discussion tool. So we now are going to be offering an eight-hour training using those Let's T Talk Race Cards to get conversations about racism and systemic racism, uh, you know, all of us more comfortable having those kinds of conversations. And then we'll be also offering additional trainings as part of this training, training program about um, LGBT and disability inclusion and, um, you know, a, a lot of those topics mm -hmm. that, that yeah. you and I care about yeah, so deeply. no doubt about it. And, and I'm glad you um, mentioned all those because, um, yeah, we both care about those so, so deeply. Um, and so, um, like diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, um, so we haven't really dug deep into that as of yet as a training, have, have we? Yeah, well, have. I think we've, um, I think the HRC has offered different trainings that certainly touch on those topics. Um, and when we have public agencies, or especially, or groups or commissions that are, that reach out to us for trainings on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we usually start them with the implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and another topic that's really important to that uh, and that I forgot to mention is bystander intervention. So we also are in building that into our um, training series, which is around what do you do when you witness or observe discrimination or a, bi a bias incident? Mm -hmm. What are the strategies that are going to work for you to step in and intervene in that moment to put a stop to the conduct and or support the person who may have been facing something wrong or um, you know call out call out bias when you see it call out racism and prejudice when you see it having an impact in your community mm -hmm. and I know um, this is very important to me as well because as the world changes, we all as individuals as people as Whoever the hell we are changing, and we need to know about those changes and be able to use the right, correct words mm -hmm. or pronouns. And so, uh, so for instance, like uh, um, L LGBTQ, you know, what I mean, um, um, is you know, you know, you know, and when, when my degree is my degree is in psychology. I'm trying to use the best word. Mm -hmm. because, uh, you're gonna teach me. You're gonna teach. You're gonna train all of us uh, through our staff. Mm -hmm. but, but anyways, um, 
Um, so you know, like one year you might you might know a person as a this this individual, and the next year there you know them as that individual, and so sometimes you might they see themselves their pronouns different from what it was, and so you get like me get clustered or saying the same for ten years I've known you, right, and, and then trying to regroup and get it to the right way to say it, and so um, so 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 I know you do it. Per, I know you, you probably got the training rolled up for us already, but <laughs> for our staff. But I, but yeah, I know you're gonna put on a training for our staff around um, how to use the correct pronouns for individuals. And I'm so happy that you're doing that. Thank you so much that you're gonna do that because it is gonna make me better. And I, it's gonna make me conscious too, uh, mm -hmm. big, big, that um, when I'm talking to a person, you know, I might want to ask them what their pronouns are. You know what I mean? Before I even before I even decided to open them on my damn mouth. <laughs> That's you know? right. Actually, one of the most inclusive things we can do on this show is when we introduce ourselves, we say what our pronouns are. That's something that is, uh, or when we have name tags at an event, that we say what our pronouns are on those name tags. Mm -hmm. As someone who is non-binary, gender non-conforming, and I use they, them pronouns, uh, it's very, it feels very welcoming and inclusive to me when I come into a space and we remember to talk about pronouns in our introductions. Then I'm like, ooh, I'm in a room of people who are thinking about this, who are trying their best. No one needs to be perfect about right. it. Just, Everyone's gonna mess up, yeah. you know, and it's about how we kind of handle get those better, moments. And get better. And then do better, yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. say you're sorry, correct yourself, uh, yeah. correct someone else, and then move on. Don't make right. it about like, oh, this is so hard for me to remember, like that kind of stuff, mm. um, which is decentering the person who is marginalized in that situation. Right. Yeah. And so, um, uh, for me, you know, I'm just so, I'm just so happy, you know, that people who <laughs> choose to be who the hell they want to damn be, you know what I mean? and, hell yeah. and recognize me, recognize me as who the hell who I am, who yeah. I choose to be. Don't call me nothing different from or nothing else than what you used to call me. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And let's just get along. You know what I'm saying? And so that's how you're gonna make me get better. Um, the thing is, one through not the thing is, but one thing that I'm, you know, my little tiny brain always wanted, like, you know, I want, I need the need to know, like, what do some of these acronyms mean? I mean, you don't have to mm -hmm. go right now. What does, you know, when you go like she, does that she, them, then, what, you know, what does, how does that go together? You know, how does that flow together? You know, yeah, so. it's something that I really hope to be able to offer some more trainings for the public and other folks who want to hear about it, because it's the language here, especially in the world of LGBT plus inclusion. Also, though, in the world of you know racial conversations and in the context of, mm. of talking about people with disabilities, our all of our language is shifting over the last several years. And um, I don't even know that I'm always like fully up to date on the current, you know, best language to use. We can always, we always all have more to learn on this stuff. So it's really important to just have that learn. openness. I was gonna learn that part though, you know, like what those acronyms mean. I mean like, you know, cause for me, like, you know, like I said, my degree in psychology. So I'm always yeah. like, you know, um, okay, that's this because of that, that, and other. And I can understand it more because of this, you know what I mean? And right. like, if I, you know, I, I can call you uh, anybody who, who, have, who, with a, anybody, use anybody's acronyms, but if I don't know what it, what it means, right. I, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't, I don't get it right, you know what I mean? Absolutely, and that's where in a lot of the trainings I've done in my life, especially around harassment prevention and workplaces and stuff, you go, you start at the very beginning. What, who are you, right, what's your and, acronym? And, and what, I mean, what, what does L, what does G, what, is B, what do these letters mean? Yeah, yeah. What do they stand yeah, for? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why are we talking well, about this? Uh -huh. Who does this matter yeah. to? And I think most folks in Vermont especially really want to be respectful, they want to be inclusive, they just don't always know the, the right vocabulary. So then we tend to maybe avoid having those conversations or avoid bringing it up because they're afraid they might mess up. But in my yeah. experience, having an openness, having a curiosity is um, half the battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, I have no problem sharing with folks, uh, answering questions yeah, they sure. may have or yeah. whatever so that, mm -hmm. um, so that they can uh, grow their understanding. Mm -hmm. To me though, 
learning from the younger generations is really important. <laughs> for me, you know, I'm in my 40s. I didn't, I wouldn't grow up knowing what, there was no language around non-binary. What does that even mean? There was not. It just didn't exist as a concept. And that's where I give my credit to the younger, the younger folks, the folks who came after me to start to create these concepts and create the language so that more of us can understand actually who we who we actually are. Yeah. So that you know, I'm, you, that's what I love about you so much, man. We 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 touched on we got the same feeling about a lot of things. Um, yeah. And, and so half hour is not going to be enough time for uh, you. And uh, me, uh, Bruce. No, not at all. <laughs> I, I already put the next show, the pronoun show, right here. <laughs> the pronoun <laughs> show sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so so you know, we, we, they tell me we still got like five minutes, for them. but but um, big um. One thing I know for a fact, because I continue, only way I can, only way that I know I'm, I'm better if I keep learning from people like you and people learning from the little kids, the youth, or whatever. That's how I get better. I always teach my youth or whoever that I'm not a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief, but I know a doctor, lawyer, and two Indian chiefs. And if I need an answer, I just go right to them and get it. And so the thing is, another thing part knowing about for me, if learning about what pronouns uh, mean is that, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself a he and a, and he is him, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, but you know what? If I learn something from somebody else who might be a she and a they, they, them, they, or, you know, I mean, she, them, or they, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I might see something there and then that's me. Yeah. You, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And so, wow. Now, now what that means to my um, he and, and um, his, his, him. You know, what does that mean? How does that change me? Because I said, wow, I do the same shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the same thing, you know? You know, figure out we, we, we're the same on this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, so, and so, uh, and that, mean, that means a lot to me from my heart, my, 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 my own mission goals and objectives and my own um, um, self. You know what I mean? My own spirituality. You know what I'm saying? That means a lot to me. That that what, what that person described then, them. Me, that's me too. Mm. And so now, how do I change he? How do I add that? Or men to the following? You know, he or him. So so that's why I need to know personally. Is just how can I learn more about myself? You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my my work around you know wanting to learn about others really did open my eyes to more about learning about myself, mm -hmm. and I think it is it's a it's a it's a journey that we take for others really, mm -hmm. but it ends up being a journey that we we take for ourselves yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess you know, what you want what you want to add, Big? I'm definitely going to talk about the pronoun show. All right. Well, uh, I mean, we'll get some guests. Uh, guests stay on Stay tuned for a pronoun show. That's right. We'll get some. <laughs> we'll get other people to help us. Help us. You know, some people who we know in the community can help us. Maybe have a word or two that can, ways we can look at it. How we can think of um, how we can think of using those words, or how how we how we can think of um, um, not necessarily using the words because the using the words means it's the using the words from the what the other individual. Want how they want us to, but um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just see. I can't even get the words out of my mouth good because I'm just. I want to though. I want to be able to. Right. Say, I want to be able to say this, this, that, and other. I learned it from Big Hartman. <laughs> ain't no, ain't no shake on this. It's all real, you know what I'm saying? You know, and so uh, you know, Big let me see. Big he let me uh, say one thing all the time, and that's B I G. Yeah. And so the B I G set. This, <laughs> that's what it is. So. So um, what about um? So I know we got. Uh, I got to come to. Uh, well, well, I'm coming to our next. Um, um, I got. We have a meeting coming up. Yep. And uh, and this, I got it all. <laughs> I got it. I got it. it it's in. Uh, where is it? It's a uh, Waterbury. Yeah, we're gonna have most of our uh, commission meetings this year in the Waterbury State Office Complex. It's a great space, mm -hmm. fairly easy to access with, um, you know, public transit, mm -hmm. great parking, um, accessible, all of that. Um, our commission meetings, as you know, are once a month. Um, they tend to be the last Thursday or the fourth Thursday of the month, um, except for November and December when we kind of combine one in the beginning of December. There are public parts of that meeting. Of course, it's a public 
commission um, subject to the open meetings law, but we, because so much of our investigation work is confidential by law, uh, there are large portions of our meetings where we're talking about cases that are not um, public. It's not public information. So we're in executive session for a lot of those meetings, but um, we always welcome the public to come and sit in. You can, um, we have a link on our website under the HRC website under about and then meetings. We have a, a public meeting link um, so that there it is, so that uh, folks can um, sit in remotely. If you if you can't come to Waterbury, that's totally fine. And that way, uh, for the executive session parts of the meeting, we don't have to kick you out, but you won't be um, included in the um, in the executive session unless you're a party to a case that's being discussed. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do hope to have more public comment, public engagement in our work, whether that be in um, commission meetings or whether it be in other outreach events that we host, that we participate in. Uh, we're looking forward to some uh, fun events for Fair Housing Month, which is in April, um, and uh, other um, cultural events that we like to be a part of. And, uh, look forward to come up and ha maybe we have an event at your at your art studio nice, nice. Um, gallery. I mean, and uh, just yeah, thinking of always uh, inviting mm -hmm. uh, the public to let us know if there's something we can come and give a talk at or share uh, resources. You know, pass out our our publications and our materials. We're always happy to try to you know get boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk to folks in the community who may have questions about our work. So I know we gotta we gotta go, but I gotta have uh, all these questions burning in my head. Um, uh, and so thank you, thank you for. I mean, you know, it's everything we are you and I talked about, you know, and, and uh, about trainings and coming into the community and boots on the ground and and. Uh, I'm, when we went to our training in um, Denver, I wish it was like Denver, Tim, like 95 right now. <laughs> Denver. <Okay. right? laughs> it was hot when we were in Denver for that know, HUD was, conference. It was like 90. I know. But now one thing, we were sitting at the table, we both were banging the table. They were talking about all the speakers, and we was right up front, you know, right there in the front with everybody who's HUD people. Um, they, <laughs> all of them saying, boots on the crowd. They was like, they ready to shake somebody. You know, they went out like, we make look at each other like, damn right, and we're gonna do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we want to we want to make uh, you know with our, our small staff, we have seven people on yep. staff, but we still want to try to make our way around the communities in Vermont, um, even the, especially the most underserved communities. Mm -hmm. And also, we've got boots on the ground at the state house. Uh, we're going to be working hard there to advance you know the right legislation and uh, speak out about anything that might be come in our way that that would be a detriment to civil rights in Vermont. And um, uh, actually two more questions. Um, so, so when a person come, um, like a community person might like join in for the community um, time they have with uh, on our, our meetings, um, can they just talk about anything? Um, we have been very welcoming of folks uh, when the agenda allows to maybe, uh, you know, if we have an open chunk of time in our day, then we would welcome someone who might want to speak to us about current events or current uh, policy issues we should be considering that pertain to mm -hmm. discrimination or civil rights. That's that's something that we're open to. It's probably best if you want to get on the agenda to reach out to our office and say, I want to come. Can you make time for me in the agenda? As you know, like our next meeting is jam packed from 9 to 430. We are booked up. Um, so sometimes we don't always have time for that kind of public comment, but I think it'd be really great to think about doing like listening sessions or going around um, and doing more public events so people can get a chance yeah. to and I, I talk to us. Like I told you, I think, um, and I'll talk to a uh, coach who is our chair of uh, commissioners um, and the rest of our commissioners that um, I want to be a part of everything that we do that's going to be working with the community and community people. But that's, that's the best I am. That's who I am and that's what I do, you know. Um, so if you want to present to somewhere, I don't have to say a damn thing, I can just carry your bags or whatever. But um, <laughs> if, if we go to a community somewhere, so I think it also is good to see a person to see a person who looks like me, yeah. part of the Human Rights Commission, and they say, wow, incredible, you know what I mean? Right. A lot of people already said that to me, what? That's incredible, you know what I mean? The governor appointed you to be on a, a commission for the Human Rights Commission, yes. Um, so one last thing, oh, in the, if you want to ask something, ask, ask, 
after this, but I have to do it because of um, a person of um, color. Um, um, now, if a person, um, a black person who looks like me or a person of POC, BIPOC, whatever, um, has been pulled over by police um, for no apparent reason, like, like no, no, as they, as as I would know, I, it's no apparent reason. Like I, I don't know if my my uh, brake light is out or nothing, but because mm -hmm. they behind me. But um, let's say it's not out, and so I'm, or say it is, whatever the hell. But what mm -hmm. should what what should I do while while I'm in the car waiting for them to come up to me? What what's what should I as a you know no you know like kind of know my rights? What should I do? Should I just sit there? Should I jump out the car? Should I run? Like what the you know? What, well, I, I can't give people advice oh, about oh, oh, criminal that's law right. That's right. or that's right. police that's right. stops, but I can say that, as you may know, in the past our office has conducted investigations of police departments who uh, were believed to have been treating black men especially differently than um, others in the community or um, failing to respond to people of color reporting crimes or reporting threats, um, and we will investigate those okay, at, sure, as sure. you know potentially um, as a it's that's considered public accommodations. Police are considered a place of public accommodations, and the services that they provide mm -hmm. need to be equal, comparable for all people. And if uh, members of our BIPOC community are feeling marginalized or treated differently by those service providers, that police are a public service, um, that's something we really want to hear about and we will be investigating. Oh, well, thank you. Well, well, go over your title again because you know it better than me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> who are you? Who are you and what do you do? So I'm the Human Rights Commission for the state of Vermont. I am the Executive Director and General Counsel. No doubt about it. And we're so pr I'm so proud to have you. You know. Thank it, you, it, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Show. Well, our next show's coming up, people. <laughs> Next show's coming up. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Vermont Show. See you next time.